I'm here in Ireland's capital, Dublin. In less than two weeks' time, Irish voters will decide in a referendum whether to allow abortion here for the first time in the history of the state. Should voters say yes to repealing the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, and polls suggest the result is still very close, the legalisation of abortion will be seen as the most tangible evidence yet of the dwindling influence of the Catholic Church. Because for the Church, there is no moral issue more important than defending the rights of the unborn child. Just about every lamppost in sight here in the centre of Dublin has banners and placards and posters crying out yes and no. There is a national debate going on. It's taking place in coffee shops, in homes and in churches as well. And it's very obvious that this is a very different place to the Ireland of 1979 when Pope John Paul II famously visited this country. As the papal helicopter touches down in the Phoenix Park, an eruption of welcome from one and a quarter million people. And they press forward for a closer glimpse, the fortunate ones to touch Pope John Paul. In the four decades since John Paul's visit, Ireland has grown much wealthier, but also distinctly less overtly religious. Back then, contraception, divorce and gay marriage were prohibited in Ireland. All are now legal. Ireland feels like a country at a crossroads. Will it choose its traditional Catholic path or will the church eventually become irrelevant? The Catholic Church needs to go back to basics and to use their experience in Ireland as what not to do. I think the church did get comfortable for quite a while in Ireland. There is certainly very serious challenges facing the church, but people of faith rise to the challenge. How did the Catholic Church go from being the unchallenged arbiter of morality in Ireland to its present diminished state? I'm meeting a redemptorist priest from County Galway whose story may be part of the answer. In 2012, Father Tony Flannery was officially silenced by the Vatican, banned from saying mass or publishing his opinions because of views he expressed on the church's teachings in areas such as sexuality, contraception and the role of women in the church. I'm sitting here in one of the quads at Trinity College Dublin in a glorious summer day and I'm taken by the fact, Tony, that there was a time when Trinity College Dublin was a very monocultural, monoreligious university and institution. It was forbidden under pain of mortal sin and eternal damnation for a Catholic to walk in the walls of where we are sitting now and all that in my lifetime. At what point did you see evidence that ordinary Catholic couples and families were disconnecting from the church's teaching. The crucial thing there was the encyclical in 1968 about contraception. That was a turning point in the Catholic Church generally, very much in the Irish Catholic Church. And I was a young priest at the time. And as a redemptorist in our work, we used to spend hours in confession boxes. And during those years after the encyclical, it had droves of young married women coming in, asking the likes of me, who didn't know the first thing about marriage or sex, about their sex lives with their husbands and what was right and what was wrong. But gradually then, through the late 60s and into the 70s, they began to stand back. These young married women said, this doesn't make sense. Don't agree with this. And you see, from once they said that about one teaching, every other teaching was up for question too. What is the average age of priests in Ireland? The average age of priests in Ireland is 70. I'm 71. Do you think the Catholic Church in Ireland, as an institution, has a future? That's a very good question now, and I'd be pessimistic about it. The big problem with the Catholic Church in Ireland is an almost total absence of leadership. What I'm talking about here are the bishops, because we've had about 30, 35 years where the policy was that you appointed bishops who were totally orthodox. And what you'll find is that people who are totally orthodox are generally not good leaders because they're generally not thinking for themselves. Tony Flannery fears for the future of the Catholic Church. But before we try to imagine the Church's likely future, it's worth recalling just how dominant it once was in the early years of Ireland as an independent country. Dermot Ferreter is Professor of Modern Irish History at University College Dublin. 
But you've got to consider, because of the partition of Ireland in 1920, the proportion of Catholics in Southern Ireland, what became the Free State, later the Republic, uh, was over 90%. So, you know, they really had an opportunity there to flex considerable muscles. And they did that in subsequent decades. I think the high point is really there in the 1940s into the early 1950s. The level of control, the level of influence that they had over various matters of social policy and public policy, but also the control over so many different educational institutions and various other institutions that were funded by the state but were controlled and staffed by religious orders. So you really get an extraordinarily dense network of Catholic control. At the zenith of its power in Ireland, the Catholic Church was led by John Charles McQuaid. As Archbishop of Dublin for more than 30 years, he drove Irish society with an iron will. Hand in hand with the leading Irish politician of the time, Eamon de Valera, Catholicism and Irishness became almost indivisible. It was McQuaid who forbade Catholics from attending Dublin's Trinity College on pain of eternal damnation because he saw the university as a dangerous bastion of Protestantism in the heart of Ireland. From his Archbishop's Palace, McQuaid directed Irish politicians to give the church control of education, health services and many other state institutions. Much of that control continues today. John Charles McQuaid was the towering figure of 20th century Irish Catholicism. He became Catholic Archbishop of Dublin in 1940. He's there until 1972. Many people pray for charity. It would be much better if they prayed for faith. Because we forget that God, whom we love by charity, is known to us only through faith. He has been described as being an Irish J. Edgar Hoover uh, in terms of his networks and his spying and his very precise keeping of tabs on, on various individuals, various organisations. So he had tentacles everywhere and he had people everywhere. And we get a sense of the power that he had, but also the fear that he was able to generate. Sometimes it comes through in simple ways, the way politicians might sign themselves off when they're writing to Archbishop McQuaid, your most humble obedient and loyal service and you get that sense of a, a cowering deference really uh, in the face of, of Archbishop McQuaid. The church's unchallengeable position under Archbishop McQuaid is certainly gone but the author and journalist Dervil MacDonald believes his legacy continues in the church's still considerable influence in today's Ireland. I think the narrative that the Catholic Church has finished is somewhat overstated certainly it is in decline if you look at things like mass attendance if you look at the number of of priests which are older, they're diminishing, they're dwindling. But when I look back and I started life um, as a journalist, um, a long time ago as a religious affairs correspondent, actually when the clerical sex abuse crisis was really starting to come into the fore, you're looking at a country that is still very culturally Catholic. So if you look at the census back in 2011, still 84% of people in this country were identifying as Catholic. That has slipped uh, in 2016 to 78%. Undeniable is how much Catholicism is a vein and a pulse in our society over 90% of our schools are Catholic maintained so many of our public hospitals which are de facto state hospitals state funded we educate the doctors and nurses and yet here we are in Dublin and there are several major hospitals um, in, in nature public hospitals where you cannot have procedures such as having your tubes tied as a woman unless it's medically indicated so if you're a woman who said I don't want to have more children you cannot do that and that is actually quite I think surprising for people I think we're a, still very much a Christian country I think our Catholicism is quite a la carte. Dermot Ferreter again. There's been a crisis of credibility, there's no doubt about that, in relation to a church that was pronouncing for decades on matters of morality and sexual morality in particular when some of its own failings were exposed. There's also been an obvious crisis of personnel in terms of the, the numbers who are there to run the church and, and to do essential work within the church uh, priests in particular. Is there a crisis of faith? I don't think so. There's still a very strong bedrock of uh, allegiance to the Catholic faith in Ireland. I've come to a community centre in North Dublin where about 50 or 60 people are gathered here tonight ahead of the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment. They're supporters of changing the law in Ireland to enable women to make a choice for abortion for the terminations of pregnancies. It's a very mixed group, male and female, all ages, 
and quite international. The story of Ireland in the past may be of a population who travelled around the world, but increasingly people are coming here. And they have a pretty conflicted relationship, I think, with the Catholic Church, because many respect what the Church meant in their parents' lives and indeed even in their own life in younger years, in their education. But they see the Catholic Church as an obstacle to the progress that they are here tonight campaigning for. I suppose Catholicism was very much part of our communities and there is good messages within Christianity. But you have to look at everything in Ireland. Like I'm coming out of an era where we're learning more and more about the institutionalisation of women. I mean, I became a mother at 15 and if I had been born in any other generation just 5, 10, 15 years before I had her, I would have been left at the gates of an institution to, to have my baby put up for forced adoption. Do you see this as a nail in the coffin of that idea of Catholic Ireland? Yeah, I think so. I don't think we should have Catholic Ireland. Yes, we have Catholics in the country and yes, they can believe whatever way they want, but we don't just have Catholics in this country anymore. We have people that don't have any religion. We have Muslims, we have Protestants, we have, we have everything. So we should be known as a multicultural, multi-denominational country. I was brought up as a Catholic. My religion was beaten into me. They had to change that. To an extent, they damaged themselves because of the behaviour of the priests, not just sexually, but their arrogance. That's not to say that there's not many amazing women involved that are nuns that have been doing missionary work abroad. And, you know, there is good people involved in, in religious organisations that do good things, but the hierarchy is where the issue is. You'll detect no nostalgia for Ireland's religious past when you meet the writer Michael Nugent, chair of the campaign group Atheist Ireland. His home, just north of Dublin city centre, puts him in the neighbourhood of some of Ireland's most iconic cultural institutions. Well, we're just outside my house where I live in Drumcondra. Uh, across the road, there's a huge patch of land that used to be an enclosed order of nuns that was sold off at the height of the boom. Uh, just behind us, there is the Roman Catholic Archbishop's Palace, which is even bigger. To the left of that is what used to be Bertie Ahern's headquarters when he was head of Fianna Fáil and Taoiseach. And to the right is Croke Park, the head of the Gaelic Athletic Association. So it's quite the place for the uh, congregation of uh, the traditional power structures in, in uh, the Republic of Ireland. And now, of course, there's a debate about the relationship between those power structures, particularly between the state and the church, a debate that really... Uh, didn't happen, say, 100 years ago. It was just taken for granted. It was. Ireland was traditionally a Catholic country. Well, the Republic was. When we had partition, we got a sectarian Protestant state in Northern Ireland and a sectarian Catholic state in the south of Ireland. Now, while there were enough Catholics in Northern Ireland to stand up for themselves and make it a contested space... There were so many Catholics in the South that it became an untrammeled Catholic state. Now, it's not that any longer. It's moved on. Ireland is now a pluralist country, but still with Catholic laws, because the laws that they put in place when they were in charge are still enabling them to run the constitution, the education system, the health system and many aspects of our society. If the church felt it could dictate social policy to Irish politicians... All of that changed utterly with the unfolding sexual and physical abuse scandals of recent decades. That recast relationship became apparent in 2011 when an official investigation into child sexual abuse by priests in County Cork, the Cloyne Report, revealed a widespread cover-up by church authorities. In a devastating speech to Ireland's parliament, the Dáil, the Taoiseach Enda Kenny declared that the historic relationship between church and state in Ireland could not be the same again. For the first time in this country, a report into child sexual abuse exposes an attempt by the Holy See to frustrate an inquiry in a sovereign democratic republic as little as three years ago, not three decades ago. And in doing so, the Klein report excavates the dysfunction, the disconnection, the elitism that dominate the culture of the Vatican today. The rape and the torture of children were downplayed or managed to uphold instead the primacy of the institution, its power, its standing and its reputation. One of Enda Kenny's predecessors as Taoiseach was John Bruton. I met him at his home in rural County Meath. Myself with Pope John Paul II, I had a, an audience with him when I was... He's been a devout Catholic all his life and still has a very strong faith. Yet in 1996, while Taoiseach, he introduced divorce in Ireland in the teeth of opposition from the church. 
While John Bruton believes Ender Kenny's criticisms of the Vatican were right, he still retains a strong allegiance to the Church's central message. Well, I think that has to be seen against the excessively deferential approach to the Church that would have been taken by Irish governments in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. Uh, and it was only a shock because it was so different from the attitude that had been taken by previous Tishi. I think what Enda Kenny was saying was a legitimate criticism of the way that the Vatican had averted its eyes from and not dealt adequately with problems of child sexual abuse within the church. Now, it was said in very trenchant and colourful terms. Uh, perhaps it could have been couched more diplomatically without any reduction in the substance of the criticism, but it, it, because the substance was valid. However, I think we're increasingly learning now that similar criticisms can be made of secular institutions, that there is a human tendency to protect the institution, to avert one's eyes about difficult uh, things that have come to light. Well, yeah, many people, I think, heard him saying something like, enough is enough, to the Catholic Church and its um, yeah. well, deferential I think that, I think, that, I think the important, it's important that criticism be made, yeah. but it's equally important that the Church be robust enough to accept criticism without losing self-confidence. Because the self-confidence of the Catholic Church does not come from bishops or priests or nuns. It comes from the essential message of the Church. Mm -hmm. It comes from God. It comes from the belief that God has came on earth, that his son gave up his life to save us. That's what it comes from. And that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. Though all the ingredients of the Catholic faith are as valid today as they were before the child sex abuse scandals, as they were in 1300 AD, and as they were in the time of Christ. The abuse scandals that have plagued the Church undoubtedly caused many Irish Catholics to question or abandon their faith. But nothing happens in a vacuum. The sexual and political revolutions of the 1960s may have taken longer to reach Ireland than other countries in Europe, but by the 1990s, they'd arrived with a vengeance. Where once lawmakers may have looked to the Ten Commandments for their moral code, increasingly, that role was taken over by secular documents, such as the European Convention on Human Rights. And with this cultural shift, Irish society became far less deferential to the Catholic Church. The incisive wit of satirists and comedians like Dave Allen allowed the masses to enjoy a joke at the church's expense, and one television programme more than any other redefined the international image of Ireland's Catholic priests. The actor Pauline McLean played Mrs Doyle in Father Ted. When Father Ted first broadcast in 1993, ah, there was a huge hullabaloo and the Catholics were going, uh, the Catholic clergy, I should say, not Catholics themselves, were going, this is wrong. And then, interestingly, over the next few years, as we made the next few series, they came to try to love it um, publicly because they realised that then they were being exposed as having been the most awful organisation for having harboured such abuse in the country for, you know, so many decades that they wanted to embrace Father Ted. They wanted us to laugh with and at the clergy. Rather interestingly, when we were doing the third series of Father Ted, we would drive home through County Clare when we were doing the outdoor bits and there were big posters everywhere because the Catholics were trying to recruit priests. And you'd see these big posters and they it's just a regular guy sitting on a desk, you know, casually lounging. This is Joe. Joe teaches computer analytics at a university. Joe is also a priest. Would you be interested in being a priest? Please call us on. It, do you know, it was perfect. And we honestly thought that maybe they were riding in on the back of Father Ted to try to just get more people to join their faith. Myself and my mother, I remember once being on holiday with my grandmother in Sligo, where they pirated the BBC and UTV and all of that. We saw Dave Allen on television. I travel around the world, and no matter where I go, somebody called Gideon leaves me this book to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Irish book, because it says it all began at the beginning. <laughs> and I remember the two of us looking at one another and going... Oh, my God, I can't believe he's saying those things out loud and was being so funny. Dave Allen was a trailblazer. He poked fun at the Catholic Church when everybody thought that they walked on water. And it was fabulous to see that, no, he was showing the feet of clay. 
But not everyone in Ireland today is turning away from the church, far from it. Some are returning and some have never left, even if they can see the institution's feet of clay. I wanted to hear what committed younger Catholics feel about their church in 2018. So I've come to Bally Buffet in County Donegal to meet Paula, Connor and Katrina. They're volunteers with a Catholic evangelistic group called Net Ministries. Net Ministries runs faith-based youth camps across Ireland. And I wondered if it was a struggle to engage young Irish people today with the message of the church, especially in the wake of recent abuse scandals. You have a generation now of people who really were raised outside of the church. So I find that there actually there's, you know, a good number who are more open to it, you know. So the stigma I would find would more often come from kind of people who are that bit older, maybe their 30s, that kind of thing, because they were raised in it and they disagree and whatever. Often when we hear people talk about what's happening spiritually in Ireland, the story is people are leaving the church in droves, people don't want it anymore. That's not your experience? That's true, but the young people I meet who do have faith, they, they own their own faith. Very so, so yeah, yeah, it's a very personal faith. Yeah. They, they have a personal relationship with Jesus and they're not just going to Mass every week because their parents are making them. I think that there is this kind of disconnect at the moment where, like Connor said, people were being forced into their faith and they rebelled against that. But now you're coming into a generation of people who haven't any experience of it. They, don't, they weren't forced to do anything. But because they weren't forced, didn't experience any kind of Catholic faith at all. So when you start speaking about it, they love to hear about it. They are so interested in it. If these young Catholics are right, those who predict a swift death for the Catholic Church in Ireland are jumping the gun. Dr Kevin Doran is the Bishop of Elphin, a diocese that covers parts of four counties in the west of Ireland. He laments the fact that proclaiming the faith has become so much harder in modern Ireland than it was in the past. But like those young people at Net Ministries, he finds hope in a new generation of believers who aren't going to church merely out of cultural habit. There are a huge number of people for whom faith is extremely important, who sometimes feel a little bit less at home in Ireland than they used to. I think there may be a lost generation out there, or even two lost generations. I don't think we can just throw up our hands and say, well, that's it. What do you think the Catholic Church in Ireland will look like in 20, 25 years? Well, in 20 or 25 years' time, the Catholic Church in Ireland will look different. It will almost certainly be slimmed down. I don't think it'll be so much based around buildings as around people. And I think that would be a healthy development. I think the future of faith in Ireland is... You know, a lot of people think it depends on bishops. You know, I, I think in many respects, bishops can offer leadership and encouragement. But at the end of the day, each Christian lives their own faith with integrity or, or otherwise. As this Saturday evening mass continues here in the city of Sligo, with a congregation of, I think, about 90 people there, mostly older, but middle-aged people there and some younger people, as well. You might have the impression that life simply goes on. We have a little bit of a, a, a folk melody through the Mass to make it more relevant and more contemporary uh, for this congregation. But around this congregation and around this city, we're surrounded by posters. Some say yes and some say no. And in the Mass tonight, the congregation prayed uh, that the will of God will be done and the common good would be seen in this society. At the end of the Mass at Sligo Cathedral, I managed to grab a word with some of the worshippers. We're just talking about why the church is important for people and why, why faith is important. Well, that's what we were brought up that way and it kind of stuck with us. I just come and I light a candle for my own people, my own mother and father and those years I didn't do it and it makes me feel good for the rest of the week, you know. There's so many people in Ireland are, are going the other direction though, aren't they? And I suppose everyone is entitled to go in whatever direction and in the end we're all going the same way, only we have different paths maybe. So, a few days before Ireland makes an historic choice on whether to legalise abortion, can we finally say that the notion of a Catholic Ireland has been consigned to the history books? I think that sometimes it can be a bit of a lazy cliché to call us a Catholic country. It is still intrinsic, and as long as the Catholic Church has control over education, and to a lesser extent, but to an important extent, healthcare, I still think that you probably could say we are a Catholic country. I don't want to live in a country where a doctor might go to jail because he wanted to 
to try to save a woman's life. Just simply that alone would be enough for me to vote yes. Because I grew up in Galway, this is really at the heart of all that I feel about growing up in Ireland. Bishop Eamon Casey, who we now know had practically had a wife and definitely had a a son, who I've met, a very wonderful man, he kept that hidden forever. He is the man who did my confirmation, so he slapped me across the face to teach me humility, and if I knew then what I know now, I think I'd have slapped him back. Well, people tend to self-identify as Catholics, mostly in Ireland. The last census, about 80% said they were Catholic, about 10% said they were had no religion, and the other 10% were minority faith. However, that 80% that says they're Catholic, most of those don't believe in the tenets of Catholicism. They don't uh, see the Pope as their leader. They don't, you know, they use contraception. They don't go to Mass. The vast majority don't believe in transubstantiation. Half of them don't believe in hell. And my personal favourite, 8% of self-identified Irish Roman Catholics don't believe in God, which I would have thought would have been a pretty low hurdle for being a Catholic. The Church is obviously going to have to downsize, to use that horrible business language, um, in relation to what it's feasible for it to control. The Catholic Church in Ireland became too powerful. And with too much power... You are sowing the seeds of your own demise. And that's precisely what happened to the Catholic Church in terms of its dominance and its influence. It simply had too much. In a way, it'll be more manageable for the Church, given that it doesn't have that same dominance. So it can concentrate on what it can realistically and feasibly control. And I suppose dealing with smaller congregations or dealing with a smaller basis of allegiance or support, it can still sustain a very important place for itself in Irish society. If the most recent polls are correct, the result of the abortion referendum could be close. It's ironic that the Irish constitution has become the space in which a new relationship between the church and state may be forged. After all, this constitution begins with the words in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, as clear a signal as any that it is a Christian, not a secular document. But Ireland lives with those kinds of ironies. The issue where abortion is concerned particularly is that we're not just talking about the woman's body. If it were just a woman's body, then it would be a different issue altogether. But we're actually talking about two bodies, and and that's the bit often forgotten. At the end of the day, each person has their vote to cast. Nobody else can make that decision for them. But obviously, if a Catholic chooses to ignore the guidance of the church, then they would have to seriously consider what is their relationship with the church on on a matter that's as serious as this. The bishop clearly struggles to understand how anyone who describes themselves as a Catholic could vote against the guidance of the church to legalise abortion. If Ireland votes to do just that, he and his brother bishops may just have to accept that Irish people, most of them Irish Catholics, don't agree and feel increasingly confident in saying so.